Hey, in this video, I would like to go over the four Gen AI architecture approaches which are out there. Prompt engineering, RAG, model fine tuning, and pre trained from scratch. Let's go. Let's start with pre training an LM from scratch. And I think this is very cool because it gives you a lot of data here. So let's go with an example and start with one is that Llama 3 70 billion parameters. So like how did Meta create it? So we are here now in LM training. So I hope you're familiar with training versus inference. If not, you can check out the other video. So what Meta did is they put 15 trillion tokens of text data into the GPU clusters. Basically they were training on 48,000 H180 gigabyte GPUs there. And after about 17 days, yeah, you're here, you're here right, of pure GPU power and pure computation, they got Llama 3 with 70 billion parameters. So of course, maybe with not with GGUF with the extension, but with some others there. But for that, I would say this is pretty intense and pretty cool because after 17 days of this, they basically converted uh, and created these uh, parameters there. So I collected also data from other vendors there who created their own uh, LLM. So you can see here model parameters, their training tokens, so the input what they had, the GPU time, GPU hardware, and the training time. And an interesting example, what I would like to pull out is Bloomberg GPT, because they basically built their own GPT, their own language model. They were using 700 billions of training tokens with their proprietary data, but then also publicly available financial data. They have a, had about 1.3 million of GPU time and they used 512 A100 NVIDIA GPUs there. And you can see the training time took 53 days. And as you can see here, like only H100 and A100 are listed, uh, the NVIDIA GPUs, because like these, these are the, the really powerful, the performant GPUs, which are specifically for high computation and where large language models basically can be created. Now let's check also the infrastructure cost there, because if you think about this, the costs are not that low. We have in this example, 400 GPUs, where like with, let's say, a 108 gigabytes GPUs and the list price for one GPU is 18,000 US dollars. Of course, it always depends. The LM training depends on the number of model parameters, the training time, the input data. So for now, we just say, hey, we will use 400 GPUs there. Now, what do we do with them if we do it like on prem? On prem, you can see that if we go with the list price there, I hope we get some discount from NVIDIA, but uh, the total cost is 7.2 million alone for the GPUs there. And then don't underestimate, of course, the electricity costs. So this is like 24,000 uh, US dollars if you would train it for 50 days there. On the other hand, we have the cloud option. So basically the single price of a single A100 GPU is $3. Of course, like if you go up in a cluster, it takes like five, six dollars, I think it's now. So it takes like three to five million dollars there. So in the end, what does it mean that Training most probably won't happen um, on the on-prem infrastructure because it costs a lot, of course. However, I see AI inferencing or inferencing of the large language model. I definitely can see it on the on-prem infrastructure there because you don't need A100 GPUs there. You can go with the L40 and so on, or like with other, with mid-sized uh, NVIDIA GPUs there, which is totally fine for on-premise inferencing there. So what do we say about, okay, let's build the LM from scratch. So you have the control of your data, you have privacy, you have the performance, you have accuracy if you've done, uh, done, it, if you've done it right, of course. But on the other hand, you have like high costs uh, and resources, like you need to be aware of that and it takes time. So in the end, it takes of course time to build one of these uh, models out there. So. Let's go to the next one is prompt engineering. So I think most of you are familiar with it. It's like natural language text describes the task for a specific model there. So with prompt engineering, it's like you optimize the prompts. So here again, we are not in training. We are just in inferencing. Here you have a system prompt. For example, you're a history teacher. Um, and then we have the user prompt. Uh, when was Cisco founded, for example? Then you can use a local large language model, like inferencing can be locally, 
or you can use an LM cloud service. So just simply via REST API, you can send uh, the data there. And then you have the model output, basically what you've seen in JSON or just like in the text there, and then uh, you have here the output. I have an example here, prompt, uh, prompting example with uh, Python code there, because usually I love to check, hey, how do people write the prompts there? What are the like do's and don'ts? So um, uh, I usually start with like a persona. So you are an assistant to a network, uh, to a Cisco networking engineer, for example, here you see at the top. Then the user wants to get information from a Cisco network device. The user request is the problem and so on. Then I put here also some Python libraries there because I want uh, the large language model to use either like NetMiko, NC, uh, um, NC client, request Nepal. Um, then device type I define, establish the connection. So I give them like a task basically, like a, a list of tasks, what the large language model should do in the specific order there. And then I usually close with, um, with the output uh, like parameters there. So for example, always print the answer to the user, only output the numbered list. How would you like to format the output? This is what I would like to give to the LM. But there are also many other like, you know, best practices there. So for example, as you can see here that um, it's a very important to give clear and specific instructions, like really to simplify them, like here, only write two sentences, dear, dear LM. Then also sometimes it helps to ask the LM not to hallucinate, like make things up. So for example, hey, if you don't, well, like, if you don't know the answer, just tell the user, just tell them you don't know it. Another cool, cool thing is like to give examples and use, uh, of course, the prompt separators there. You can check it in the LM uh, documentation always. Like sometimes I use XML tag, sometimes I use uh, like the, the hashtags there. So um, as, uh, as the documentation says, basically. And finally, of course, adopt the persona. So like your network engineer. So uh, like in the end, it's kind of important that they have like a setting or just that you set a base there for the LM. If it's more technical, say network engineer. If it's more finance, go with a financial advisor and so on. Retrieval augmented generation. So I put a video already on there about uh, how you can create your own API and code assistant, which uh, I also use as an example here. So we are here now localhost at my uh, MacBook here, and you can actually see that this is my running a Python application with the interface chainlit. So I can just write, hi, who are you? Let's see who, we, uh, who this person is or who the LM is. And so this is the Cisco Catalyst uh, Center REST API and Python code assistant. For the LM, I am using ChatGPT for Omni Mini, but uh, you can use, of course, Llama 3.1 as well. I only use it now because the inference time is very low compared uh, like when I use the LM, which is directly on my laptop. So what I do it here now is instead of not going through the documentation, for example, I'm here with the Catalyst Center documentation REST API, and I would like to get the layer three topology details. I am going here. I can, of course, put here the, uh, the Python code as well and so on, but maybe I would like to, I don't know, export it as well immediately uh, or, or do some, some other stuff as well. So basically, I'm just writing here, get me the L3 topology and export it to, I don't know, to doc, to doc format. Uh, let's just write word, uh, word doc format and so on, and then let's do it. So I will show you in a bit, of course, how REC works, but basically it's, um, the, it's using the, the, the documentation already in order to create a nearly done Python code example with the documentation. So at first it does the authentication in the re retrieval access token, which is of course very important for Catalyst Center there. Then it retrieves the layer three topology. And I think this is exactly the same what we have here. Yes, perfect, it's the same. And then it uh, exported data into word format. And there you go, you have Python docx, it, it recommends this library there. And then either if we would like um, copy paste, like we would like copy paste the code, change username, password, the topology type, what you'd like to have. And then you can see here all what's what's happening, like the whole functions there. And uh, basically it will be exported to a docx. And here are some notes there, of course, like that you need to install the library that you make sure you replace uh, the credentials there as well. So the thing about RAG is the most important or prominent part is the vector database, what you can see here. In this case, I'm using ChromaDB. 
And we are here in the LLM inferencing phase. So we are not training, this is only inferencing. So we can start here, what I did before, is the user is asking for API systems. So for example, here this example is, get a list of all network devices there. So we have the user query to the Python application. And then this specific user query will be vectorized, which means that the text will be converted into a vector. So if we say, get a list of all network devices, ChromaDB has already stored, for example, the Catalyst Center documentation. And so it returns the specific documents, which is semantically similar to the user query. So for example, list of all network devices, most probably it will look for the REST API call for where you can get all the network devices from Catalyst Center there. With this context information, let's say this is like two, three pages of, uh, in the, within the documentation, you input this to the large language model with the user query. So you say, hey, get a list of all network devices, and then you put in three pages of the Catalyst Center documentation. And then you can use OpenAI GPT, like a cloud uh, LLM service with REST API, or you can use a local service, like uh, with Olama, for example, Olama 3, 3.1, and then the LLM has the output what you just saw with documentation and Python code there. So in RAG, you need to at first import the data into a vector database. And you can do this on the fly as well, like all the time. So this is the cool thing about RAG because your data is always up to date. So for example, we have a user guide with a 900 pages PDF file. And at first we need to chunk the documents there. Why do we need to chunk it? Well, you can't put the whole uh, user guide, which is 900 pages, like a lot of tokens into the uh, large language model there is a so-called LLM context window. So a context window, as you can see here now, is that the input and the output is the whole context window. LLM has its limitation be where it can, it can only output a specific number of tokens. And you can see it here that the system prompt, the user prompt, and also the context information is part of the input prompt, like of the part of the input. And you also need, of course, some tokens for the output for the LM completion. And this is where basically you need to be careful of because otherwise you run into an error that the LM can't uh, put like the whole data out. Thankfully, the context window got bigger, way bigger over time. So Llama 3.1 has 128,000 tokens there, uh, GPT-4.0, 128,000, Cloud 200K, maybe even more now. And this is why we need to chunk the documents there. And then finally, we will embed it into vectors and then insert it into the vector database there. Inside the vector database, you can see it like here, how it kind of works. So first of all, you have embeddings, which represent items in a continuous data vector space. So basically you can embed various text data there and you put it into a vector database there the vector space is capturing the semantic and syntactic relationships between the words. So for example, what you see here is that Catalyst, Cisco and Center and so on is more grouped together here, whereas banana, apple, strawberry, like the, like the food is more grouped here. So in the end, it's always, it's, it depends like that the semantically similar words are more grouped together and this is important for the semantic search. The cool thing is like it's very cost efficient, it's easy to implement and with the vector database you have control of the data. Like you can basically set a limitation, a filter on what kind of data uh, leaves your vector database and goes into the LM prompt there. On the other hand, you need to create a, an, an external uh, resource there, right? Like you need to have like a vector database there, but all in all, RAG is basically the most efficient and most popular way in order to get started really quickly, create a knowledge base in order to like interact with the LM with your specific proprietary or private data there. The next architecture approach is model fine tuning. So basically what you do there is you enhance the pre-trained base model with a specific data set. Let's go into detail. So here's a LM fine tuning example. So we already fine tuned or like we got already the fine tuned LM, which was fed and trained with millions of trillions of tokens of text data. And again, trained using the transformer architecture there. Um, and now the thing is that we are applying on this specific 
nearly done, let's say, LM or like which is already pre-trained, we apply now our own custom data set. So we basically fine tune using the pre-trained parameters, like the parameters which are already there. So we are, we are not starting at zero and we fine tune with instructions, with this specific custom data set, we fine tune this LM there in order to do our specific task what we defined here. And finally, we got another fine-tuned LM as an output there, which is, of course, used or fine-tuned for the specific task there. So if you ask them this fine-tuned LM at a task, for example, then it might fail there because this is fine-tuned on our specific data set there. Let's go and look at an example. So here we are using supervised fine-tuning there. The goal is to create Ansible configuration files for specific use cases. So for example, we have here the collection, which is Cisco IIS and Cisco Meraki. Then we have the description of configuring the access control list here in this case, or in the Meraki case, create or update an SSID on the Meraki network. And then we put in a use case. Of course, we should put it longer, like uh, just not a few words, but the longer the better. But this is the use case is kind of the description or similar to description as well, where the user prompt can basically say, hey, rename, like in the Meraki example, rename, rename the Wi-Fi name. Like what the user meant for sure is that, hey, rename please the SSID of the Meraki network. And then this Ansible playbook will be given back to the user. So um, this is kind of important for like the, the fine tuning part where the playbook code is actually the, the goal, what we would like to have or what should be the output there. And the description, the use case is the aim of what the playbook code does. You can also do this, of course, like with Mistral, with OpenAI, they have some specific tool sets where you basically can do your own fine tuning there as well. So fine tuning is definitely cost efficient on domain specific tasks. And what's also important is that a smaller fine tuned LM can outperform a larger LM. This is very important. So you can, for example, uh, use a small la a large language model for a specific domain, which is fine tuned as well on this task. And it will definitely outperform the much larger open AI, for example, even. On the uh, limitation side is that Data preparation is a time consuming task. Don't forget it. Like you need to prepare like quite a lot of data for the data set. And when you are preparing the model and you use your own data, you can't actually say that which kind of data should leave the model and which should stay inside the LM basically. So I hope you get my angle there. So you can expose the model with some private data and there it can lead to some privacy issues there. So it always depends, okay, where the data is, is coming from, of course. And finally, like the whole model needs to be uh, retrained when adding new data. So this is again, this speaks more for RAG. So if you are changing always the data there, then a RAG might be a more uh, cost efficient solution there. I hope this video was useful for you. These were the four Gen AI architecture approaches. Let me know in the comments what kind of approach you are using. Thank you so much and bye.